FYI, make sure you...
take a second and bow our heads, please. Dear Creator, we thank you for this group. We thank you for this body. As we are looking for how we are your community, how we are your people, how we are your love, we just ask you to be with us as we're finding that place and finding that footing and help us to, to reach those that need that love and that grace, whether they realize it or not, Lord. We just ask you to be with us as we're taking those steps. Uh, Lord, we just ask you and thank you for helping us survive October. It's been quite a busy one, and we just thank you for the ways that you have moved in this congregation to do so. We ask you to be with us as we're worshiping today. Help us to find your love and grace in the words you we hear today. In your son, Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. Hey, Carol, can we jump to the third song there, Build My Life? Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath you could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Yeah. 
no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Thank you, Sparrows, for getting us started. Good morning, church. How are you this morning? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Hey, so today we're celebrating. We're celebrating that it's almost the 31st day of October. Who's, who's excited that October's almost over? <laughs> John's, John's hand was up first, okay. So that's what we're doing for the first part of our morning together. We're going to be celebrating uh, the ministries that have been so successful because of you, the living saints, uh, working through the month of October and into this fall season. Uh, in the middle segment, we're going to be celebrating our new ministry initiative with communities and schools. And Executive Director of CIS Chesterfield, Ashley Hall, is here with us this morning. And Ashley's going to come bring us a word about what they do and how we can continue to be a part of that. And then in our last segment this morning, we'll be remembering the saints who claim the promise of resurrection this year. And if you've looked at the back of your bulletin, you can see the impact of those losses on our congregation. Uh, so there are, I think, eight or nine folks from within the congregational membership, uh, but there are another 20 that are listed there that are close friends and family members of others that are part of our faith community. And so we'll be remembering them in the last part of our uh, worship together, and then we're going to have some lunch. Baked potato bar, we got lots of desserts, and uh, I'm real excited about eating potatoes with, do we have steak? Sure. <laughs> Friends, let us pray for the day. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day. We pray that you'll pour out your spirit upon us. We have come to celebrate you and the gifts that you give us and how you are calling us to uh, spread the good news and be the kingdom of God in this community in Chesterfield. Make your presence known today. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Friends, if you're able, let's stand for our call to worship. It's a responsive uh, call and response. Friends, we meet at different times with different vibes. We speak different languages and sing different hymns. We wear different clothing and have different gifts and talents. We join together on one journey. The journey to unite with the risen Christ. We join together with God as the kingdom of God comes and as God's will is done. Let us join with all our sisters and brothers in worship and true communion with God The sparrows are going to lead us in a couple of songs, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, and Bind Us Together.
You may have a seat, make yourselves kind of comfortable, but not too comfortable. Karen Peterson's going to come and read our first scripture for us this morning from the Gospel of Matthew. Karen, thank you for doing that today. Amen. And indeed, that's what we ask God for. Recall that we entered into the fall season back in September with a call to prayer. And uh, throughout the fall, as we uh, ramped up and prepared for October and into the month of October, uh, we were invited to pray with every occasion in which we gathered, whether it was working a shift in the pumpkin patch or on Wednesday nights with the kids or music rehearsals or business meetings, every occasion that we uh, began by asking God to bless the ministries of this church, to bring out the workers uh, for gathering the harvest. And so that's what we've done. So we're going to celebrate this morning some of the, um, some of the numbers, some of the metrics, if you will, of uh, our October celebration. Um, we served uh, in the pumpkin patch. Well, let's, let me start here. There were 2,700 pumpkins, and there are like 10 left. And so as soon as church is over, you, go, you can go get those last 10. Okay. We had about 120 volunteers that showed up on uh, that day in September, right before October 1st, to unload the tractor trailer of those 2,700 pumpkins. We had folks from the church, from Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts, the Robotics Club at uh, L.C. Bird High School, and others who just um, happened to be driving by and saw that we were having a good time in the front lawn. Seriously, uh, and stopped to help. And, uh, and so we had about 120 people that helped unload that truck. Uh, throughout the month of October, we've counted about 60 people who have served in the pumpkin patch, um, meeting new folks in the community, being uh, emissaries of Trinity Church, and four or five of those are not even members of our church. Uh, but are connected peripherally or just wanted to be a part of it. Um, we've been doing this for 29 years, is that right, John? Something like that. 
I think, Ashton, I think last year they told me it was 29, and the year before that it may have been 29 too. It's still 29. <laughs> We've been doing it for a long time, and the community, as you guys know, know us as the Pumpkin Church. Uh, in fact, in my very first conversation with uh, Tanika at Salem Church Middle School, I was trying to describe to her where we were located. She's only lived in the community three years. And I said, we're across from Wells Fargo Bank. And she said, oh, the church that has the pumpkins. I said, yes, we're the church who has the pumpkins. And that was in August, okay? That wasn't even in October. Um, we figure, um, just based on the number of uh, sales, the number of transactions, that we encountered about 700 um, community members uh, at the pumpkin patch this fall. 700 different households that came and purchased pumpkins or mumps uh, during the month of October. And that's a tremendous outreach. That's a tremendous connection with our community uh, when we do that. And so we want to celebrate that this month. Uh, we also want to celebrate... Um, Yesterday, the fall festival, where's Vicki? Yesterday, the fall festival, we estimated 200 people came yesterday. Yeah. And, and that is considerably more than the year before. And uh, I think this is one of those things that, um, like some of the other October ministries we do, it's building up a little momentum on its own. Uh, kids and families know that they can come and hang out for an hour or two hours with us uh, in safe space uh, and do trunk or treating and play games and things like that. So thank you to all of you who helped to make that possible yesterday. Uh, two weeks ago, um, we had uh, Brunswick stew and apple butter be made in the same day. Uh, 22 people, including two non-members, made and sold 520 quarts of Brunswick stew, and about 40 people made and sold 256, that's right, 256 uh, pints of apple butter. And all of that was done on the same day in the, in the pouring down rain. Yeah. Um, so part of, part of recognizing and celebrating this is just to acknowledge the work that you have done this month. Uh, to foster the, the spreading of the good news and goodwill within our community and just doing that kind of community outreach where we're connecting with our neighbors and building relationships with them uh, and just kind of loving on them. Uh, because all of these things, other than some of us who got a little bit wet on that day, um, all of these things are full of joy, right? They're full of joy and people come and they have a good time and they're smiling and laughing. We're doing the same with them, whether it's in the pumpkin patch or the fall festival or giving them some Brunswick stew. Yeah. So thank you all for that very much. I want to show you too, um, so you know, we often talk about the money, and I promised John, and said, I'm not going to talk about the money today, uh, but I do want you to know where, uh, where the money goes. So the money that's raised from pumpkin sales and Brunswick stew and apple butter uh, is distributed back into the community. Uh, there's walking assistance with folks who just show up and need uh, help with uh, food or gas for their car. Uh, we do support uh, UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, Disaster Relief. But we do summer camp tuition for children who are differently abled. We support the Scouts. CHASM, the Place of Miracles Cafe, SOAR 365, Heart Havens, UMFS, all of these are groups that the effort in October goes to support, and very little of that money actually stays in the church. It's separated out to different groups like the United Methodist Women in the Fellowship Class and the men, uh, but it all gets redistributed back out in missions to the community. And, uh, and I just want to, I want to thank you guys for making all of that happen this month. Give yourselves a, a round of applause. So I would like for uh, Vicki and Lynn, who headed up the pumpkin patch this year, to come up, and John Morris, who headed up uh, the pumpkin patch, uh, the pumpkins themselves, to come up, um, and Vicki, who uh, leads our children's ministry and coordinated all of yesterday's fall festival. So you guys should know, as um, Vicki and Lynn are making their way to the front where everybody can see them, you guys should know that we held multiple committee meetings, as the churches want to do. We did uh, um, congregational surveys. We did random interviews with folks as they came and went during the month of October, trying to decide what the most appropriate uh, gift of recognition would be for each of you.
to receive uh, for your work this month, and we decided oversized pumpkin pies. <laughs> You're welcome. You might have some help. Yep, yep, yep. We, um, we could not have done October uh, without the leadership of the four of you, and we are really grateful for that. Thank you so much. You need to hold on one second. Karen? Karen Poole? So John is also the stew master in charge of those 520 quarts of Brunswick stew that we made. Uh, Karen oversees the fellowship class. She has lots of help, and John will tell you the same thing, uh, that there are lots of people that are involved in making these things happen. Um, I'm missing a bag. I bet here it comes. Mm -mm, here it comes. Okay, so... Um, those same surveys that we asked the congregation, like what we should give you guys for your leadership, can I open this for you? Now you open it, I'll hold your pie, how about that? I'll give it back. <laughs> so John's in charge of the Brunswick stew, and Karen is in charge of making apple butter. So Karen got Brunswick stew, and you got the apple butter. Thank, no, thank you guys. There was some skepticism when we decided we were going to do um, both the stew and the apple butter in the same day. Um, but we did it in the pouring down rain. It was wonderful. Thank you guys very much for your leadership. <laughs> Kids are getting ready to come and sing, uh, but before they do that or while they're on their way, I want to pray a prayer of thanksgiving today. Um, so let's do that. Holy God, we give you thanks for uh, calling and equipping and empowering your people to be spreaders of the good news, to be uh, harvesters, to be advocates for community development, for being present when the invitations are issued. Hmm. We've talked, oh God, about what we'll do with our invitations. Will you see how this community of faith responds hmm. with the invitations that they've been given? Thank you, oh God, for placing generosity in our hearts and a sense of gratitude within our purpose and our ministries. All of these things we name in thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
thank you guys. That was wonderful. So you guys have heard me say this before, that one of the things that uh, I value most in this faith community is our Wednesday night children's ministry. We bring kids together uh, with uh, responsible adults and teach them Christian community. They share a meal together, they play together, they study the scriptures together, and they learn to sing and worship together. And it's just a, a very powerful testament to how we make disciples and form them and shape them uh, in the life of the church. And so we're really grateful for that ministry. Some things in the life of our community I wanted to um, share with you this morning. The Chasm Collection of, um, for the uh, Thanksgiving meals, uh, we're, gather we're still gathering bags through Decem December. November the 12th, that's two more weeks from today, and um, money if you're making a monetary contribution instead of bringing the bag of groceries, that's due today. Uh, but the groceries will be gathering for two more weeks, and you can just put them in that back corner over there. Uh, we are, of course, always continuing to gather uh, for our support at Salem Church Middle School, the Communities and Schools program there. Uh, next Sunday, uh, in this space, between worship services, uh, beginning around 9.30 a.m., we'll be putting together uh, kits for the homeless. And uh, on the table going out, if you didn't see it coming in, there's a list of things that we need for those kits. Uh, so if you'd pick one up and uh, see if you could do a little shopping this week, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, Stephanie Griffith will be leading us in doing that next Sunday morning in between the two services. Um, yes, ma'am. There's a microphone here if you need it. <laughs> thank you, Vicky, and and thank you, thank you, Shelley, for owning that. Yeah. Hey, so we had a uh, charge conference uh, this past Tuesday, and for all of you uh, Methodist nerds, you know that we do this once a year to formally approve uh, leadership and and things like that. Uh, so we had that down at Chester Church with other uh, United Methodist churches in the community. Uh, but one of the things that we did there was we finalized our leadership for next year. So I want to just ask the current uh, leadership board, if uh, you're here this morning, if you would just stand so that we can recognize you. And I want to invite the new board members to also stand alongside you, Vicki Bird and Carol Shelby. Uh, also, um, Carol Shelby, I did it again, Carol Shepard, I'm sorry, Carol. Um, Shelby Coleman and April Brockman. Where's April? There she is, April Brockman. So they will come on, um, they will come on board effective January the 1st, uh, but they're actually going to start work <laughs> next Saturday. Uh, we have a, a strategic planning session with uh, Chris Bennett of the Spark Mill, and uh, they'll be a part of that next Saturday as well. So thank you all for your leadership and for your service to Trinity Church. I want to give you a couple of updates this morning. Maury Beck is at Sheltering Arms Hospital. He was uh, released, discharged from MCV on Friday evening uh, to begin working on rehab at Sheltering Arms, and um, everyone is really excited about that, including Maury. He was ready for a change uh, after six weeks at MCV. Uh, Pat Madison is still at St. Francis Hospital. Uh, as of yesterday, she would been placed back in intensive care to try to manage her blood pressure. Uh, and uh, Pat is our music director. And uh, David Bailey, who we've been tracking for a week or so, is right here this morning. So we're grateful for all of the healing and health care uh, that's been taking place with our folks, just to name those three who have been recently hospitalized or currently hospitalized. Um, the ushers are going to come and gather our offering. The sparrows are going to sing us a song. 
a Jason Mraz song, which just tickles me to death. And, uh, and before we do that, let me pray for us, friends. Holy God, we give you thanks this morning for the opportunity to, uh, to give back. We are grateful for that which you have blessed us with, not just um, monetarily, but um, passions and desires and um, motivations, skills and talents and gifts. And these things we offer to you when we participate in the life and the ministries of this church. And we also promise to pray for the church and for, for your work. We promise to be present. We promise to share our gifts and our talents and to bear witness to the good news. And so this morning, as we offer our gifts and the ushers come around, we give you thanks for this opportunity. May these gifts be multiplied, and may they be used to further the kingdom. May they be used to build up our community. May they be used to feed the hungry and clothe the, the naked and house the homeless. All in the powerful name of Jesus, we offer these gifts. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
gets bad sometimes And maybe they should Look for the good Look for the good Yeah, look out for all the heroes in your neighborhood Look for the good Look for the good Life sure would be sweeter if everybody would Look for the good in everything Look for the people who will set your soul free It always seems impossible until it's done Look for the good in everyone It's your turn to stand and sing now as we join together in singing Pass It On. Friends, you may be seated. Judy's going to come and read us a passage of scripture, one of my favorites from uh, the writings of Paul in chapter 8. I want to introduce Ashley, though, Judy, before you read um, and set the stage for 
for your reading, okay? Ashley Hall is Executive Director of the Communities and Schools in Chesterfield County, and she has a long history, um, well, long is relative, I guess. She has a, a, a professional history of collaboration and community development, and uh, we're grateful that she is working now as a part of the Chesterfield community. In addition to her professional work here at CIS, in the past, in recent past, she has led the Capital Region Collaborative. She served as Director of Strategic Engagement at the United Way of Greater Richmond, and uh, earlier in Guatemala as a Peace Corps volunteer. She actively volunteers herself, serving on the Board of Directors for the Manchester YMCA and the Perkinson Center, which is dear to our hearts, volunteering with her neighborhood association and is a big sister with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Richmond. Uh, Ashby and her, uh, Ashley and her family live in uh, Westover Hills, and, uh, and so we're grateful that you are here today. Um, Judy's going to read us a little piece of scripture, and then we invite you to come. No? Oh, there we go. All right. I feel weird with my backs to you guys. I'm really sorry. All right. Well, good morning. I'm so excited to be with you all this morning. It is such a beautiful space that we're in, and I have my heart having those kiddos sitting back here. I've never um, been in a church where, where that happened, and I really loved that. That was awesome. Um, I have to tell you, too, I always, I do a lot of speaking as the executive director, but I always get excited when I get to be at a church service. My grandfather was a pastor, so I always feel like I'm channeling him a little bit um, in these moments. Not probably doing nearly as well as he would do, but excited to be with you all. Okay, so we'll go ahead and jump right in. I wanted to thank you guys first and foremost <clears throat> on the start of this partnership with Communities and Schools. I know um, some of you have started coming over to Salem um, to kick with us, which is incredible, and have been doing some things around some of our basic needs support too. So I look forward to giving you kind of a um, higher scope around our work today and really kind of kicking off this partnership. So our mission really is to surround communities, is to surround our students with a community of support, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. It's really about making sure that we can address any of the barriers that our students are having to being successful. So we're part of a national organization, which is incredible because we have colleagues all over the country doing this work, and considered the largest and most effective dropout prevention program in the country. But what I love is that everything we do is hyper-focused on Chesterfield. We're understanding the strengths of our community, understanding the needs, and everything we do about what's happening here in our community, specifically at the 13 schools where we serve. So we serve students across those 13 schools. The need in Chesterfield, I think, often surprises um, But the reality is nearly 40% of Chesterfield County school students are economically disadvantaged, 40%. And if you think about how big Chesterfield is, that's a lot of kids, right? We're talking about 25,000-ish. They and their families are really struggling. And, you know, we often, I think, think about poverty and need being a very urban issue. But if you think about that number 25,000, that's more than the totality of students in Richmond City. I think that perspective is really interesting to bring. So if you think about, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we serve students. There's a lot of reasons why we need to be at different schools. But poverty is a big driver of that. And that's because of the impact that that has on education, right? When students 
come in from a family that has been struggling. They're often coming um, behind a lot of ways with their language, with um, exposure to things. There's often um, a lot of instability in other areas, whether that's their housing, health care, you know, the types of things that they're dealing with on a regular basis. And we know that that connects to how they do in school. Um, we also know that coming out of the pandemic, I know churches have certainly felt, um, felt the longer-term impact of that as well, right? But I think we are, we are just now figuring out what those years are going to do for our kids. I was at a really um, interesting seminar a couple of weeks ago with um, a brain scientist who talked about all the work that they've been doing, literally looking at how brain scans of kids have changed in that time frame, that literally points of their development have stopped. And I think we're really still, we're going to be figuring out for years to come how that is going to impact our kids. So a couple of you have had the chance to go over um, and meet Tanika and be, you know, at Salem Church, but I thought maybe I would bring a little bit of a school to you. So we have got a video, Cross Fingers Will Work, um, that's actually from last year at um, one of our other middle schools, Falling Creek Middle. So I hope it will play. Yeah, but if, if he wasn't there, um, it'd, probably be, it'd probably be a lot harder than it should have been. Our mission here at Falling Creek Middle School is to definitely engage each and every student. As middle school students, they're developing socially, emotionally, physically, maturity begins to kick in. So we definitely want to make sure we're addressing the challenges, but also moving our students forward. Communities and schools aligns exactly with our mission and reaching out to the families and the students that need that extra support and that they're prepared for the application as well as seeing the future beyond eighth grade. The mission of Communities and Schools in Chesterfield is to surround students with a community of support, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. We have an amazing team of site coordinators who work in schools that have a lot of high need students and we work in order to kind of bridge the gap towards them being successful in school and being able to finish and graduate and go on to live successful lives. Falling Creek Middle School is a very special place. Um, we are extremely diverse. We have students that come from over, well, let's say 25 countries. Uh, we are one of the larger middle schools. Among our students, 47% speak another language other than English at home and 26 have been identified as English language learners, which means they are acquiring the English language. 52% of our students approximately come from single parent households or in foster care. So there's always a need, um, always a challenge that needs to be met. This is a Title I school, meaning that a majority of our students and their families come from lower income families. It's an amazing group of kids who recognize their potential and where they can go. Sometimes I get to a good point and sometimes I get to a bad point. And when I'm at that bad point, Marty's there to help me out and he helps out other kids too, not just me. Mr. Marty's caseload, and I say caseload because even though he reaches all the students in the building and is familiar with all of them, there are specified students that have been assigned to Mr. Marty through the CIS caseload where attendance may have been an issue of concern, classroom behavior may have been an issue of concern, and just those students that are hard to reach. And Mr. Marty has made an effort to build relationships with those students, which keeps them in school, holds them accountable with grades. If there are any family needs, Mr. Marty is able to address that. It's a multi-tiered approach. The, the first tier is I work with the school as a whole, uh, providing different needs that could benefit our student population, also our teachers. Then we have tier two in which we work in small groups um, and working to identify groups of students who kind of have similar needs that we can work towards helping them empower each other and find success. And then tier three is our one-on-one -on -one level. And I look to find students who I can work with, who I can help kind of bridge the gap and fill in those areas. He checks in on like, on how I'm doing, how things are at home, how things are here, if I'm in a good mood or a bad mood. We talk about if I do have a problem or if something's like happening, we talk about it. It just feel good after we're done talking because then I feel like a new person and I feel fresh after the talk. Having the site coordinators at the schools, if you didn't have them, the program wouldn't work. 
Sometimes the children are, are surprised to learn that, wow, these adults have gone through some of the same things I've gone through. I enjoy speaking with the students and I enjoy being able to help them out. I enjoy uh, looking back and seeing the world through their young eyes again. And that's something, some of the stuff we forget as we get older. It's all about getting a specific plan for each individual kid. And so I would meet with the kids on my caseload. Some of them I meet with them once a week. Some kids I feel like I meet with them every day. Other kids, we've built up a rapport to where they know that I'll check on them every other week. So it's really about having an individual plan that works best for each student. I'm really grateful to, that I got to know him and that I can call him my counselor. Ever since I met Marty, I've been doing better than before and it seems easier to like do stuff in the classroom. Whether it's just visiting a college, whether it's getting exposure to careers, or whether it's just getting to value their education, my job is to kind of bring everything together from the people, the resources, and the community as a whole to empowering our students to have the best life possible for them. I love that video. I think it um, shows the work so nicely. I'll also say too, since you all are interested in mentoring, that the woman who was on there um, briefly talking about the power of it. She has been a mentor with us for many years and the girl who kind of had her back to us because she was very shy about the video, she, um, they've been together since she was in elementary school and now they're at middle school together. So she's kind of been following her, which is really cool. Um, uh, Carlos, Mr. Marti talked a little bit about this, so I won't go into it, but really the way that we um, do this work is we kick off the year with a needs assessment, understanding what those needs are from a school perspective and then from individual student perspectives, and we put a plan in place for the rest of the year. And everything we do either serves a full school, targeted students and groups, or individualized students. I wanted to um, talk a little bit about sort of our guideposts. You know, I think this is something churches understand, sort of where you place value, where you believe you should be working. So the next slide is a little bit about what we call the CIS five basics. So this is, these are the five things that we believe every single child needs and deserves to be successful. The first is a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a caring adult. So this is, research shows, the number one reason why a student who's struggling or from a challenging background can thrive. The number one best predictor of success is having someone consistent who's there for you. I think probably all of us in this room um, can point to or think about somebody from our past who was really influential for us. So when we think about that, of course, that's our site coordinators. We have one or two in each of our schools. Um, but that's also mentors that come in, tutors that come in those other adults in the community that are showing them that they have value and matter and, and, and support them. The second is a safe place to learn and grow. You know, many of our students are coming from really incredibly hard situations, um, often surrounded by violence, drugs, gang types of things, you know, housing instability, and we really work to create a space in our schools, in partnership, of course, with the schools that feels really so safe and welcoming. Um, we do things like create mindfulness spaces so kids have, um, if there's a, a conflict or there's something going on at school, they can pop into that space for a few minutes and calm down and have access to some tools there. Um, we do conflict resolution groups. We do, you know, all sorts of things like that to help kids really build their skills so that they can go out and deal with some of the hard things going on, right? The third basic is a healthy start and a healthy future. Um, that was reflected, I think, a lot in that scripture a bit, but we know that kids can't learn if they don't have their basic needs met. So we really work to make sure whether that's food, weekend food backpacks, eyeglasses, um, you know, beds at home. We just worked with a, a partner of ours to deliver 150 beds to students. Can you imagine not having a bed to sleep in or sharing with multiple siblings? Like, of course you're not waking up refreshed and ready to go to that algebra class, right? Um, some of those are, are interesting, and we've seen such a, an increase in those from the pandemic, but sometimes those can be, can really solve a problem quickly. Um, I think back to a student we had who was that student that every teacher in the building knew about, and he was a, he was a young one, y'all. He was in pre-K, so he was already known in the building for um, really disruptive behaviors and kind of having these, like, freak outs, and, you know, site coordinator got to know him and realized that she thought maybe he was having struggles seeing. So we connected him with our partner, got him eyeglasses, 
When the doctor came, they said, this is the close, closest to legally blind that you can be. This kid is freaking out because things are coming at him all the time and he doesn't know what they are. The second he had glasses, no more behavior issues. And we don't often have like quick wins like that. So when we do, it's like, yes, this is amazing. Um, but it just goes to show, you know, before we kind of label a situation, how do we dig in a little bit deeper to understand it? The fourth is a marketable skill to use upon graduation. You know, I think about how are we igniting passion in our students? How are we helping them get the skills? Yes, our goal is that we get them to that graduation stage, but what the day after that, right? So we do a lot to do, you know, providing tutoring, literacy programs, leadership skills. You know, we take our kids on enrichment trips. That's something that happens so less often at under-resourced schools to be able to go visit a college campus or go, you know, see a, a business in action at their place of work. Really try to provide some of those um, equitable opportunities to see their futures. And the, the fifth one is my favorite, a chance to give back to peers and the community. And I really love this asset-based approach that we take. You know, we believe that every one of our students has something that they can contribute. So we do things like create volunteer and leadership opportunities for them. Um, one of my favorite, and he didn't talk about it in the video, but it's under, it's uh, Falling Creek Middle and Falling Creek Elementary are right next to each other. So our site coordinator, um, Carlos at the middle school, identified some of his students who he knew were, you know, leaders in the school, but not always the best reasons. Um, and then our site coordinator at Falling Creek Elementary identified a group of kindergarten boys who were already kind of starting to act up a little bit and paired them in it or paired them in a near peer program. And for the first time, all those boys at the middle school were like, wait, I'm the leader, I'm a mentor. I mean, they couldn't believe that dad in that way. And it really changed kind of the way they approached things, which was cool. So um, I'll share a little bit, uh, our outcomes are up on the stage. I love that you referenced your metrics from all the stuff you guys are doing in October. We are also very, very data driven and, and really focused. So I don't know how much if you guys can see those, but we're really, really proud of that. You know, we focus on attendance, academics, um, behavior and social emotional learning. And then ultimately, you know, last year, 94% of the kids that we worked with were promoted or graduated. And those kids that are those case managed kids that we track numbers on, those are our hardest to serve kids. So for 94% to move on is really, really, really incredible. Um, the next slide is a little bit about ways to get involved. And I know you all are already getting started with some of that. But I will highlight and maybe can even send out an email afterwards, Pastor Allen, with some upcoming events, opportunities to get involved. We do a bus tour where you can actually get on a yellow school bus and we go visit three of our sites. And you can kind of see the work in action because it's so much better than just me talking about it. Um, we have other education opportunities. This year in particular is going to be um, really exciting. It's our 30th anniversary. Um, so we are going to be having things all throughout the year that focus on education and volunteering and celebrating um, and are just so excited for those opportunities. So we'll share those. Um, the last thing I wanted to share kind of before I close out, um, you know, I was thinking about you all um, taking this mentoring journey and, and the, the power of relationships. And I was thinking about something that happened at the end of last year that I got to witness and I wanted to share that. So. More than a decade ago, we had a student, we'll call him Khalil, and he was over at Chalkley Elementary. He had a much older brother who was in and out of jail, um, lots of issues with law enforcement, um, was involved with a gang, just some pretty, pretty hard stuff at home. And Khalil had um, a single mom who was working jobs, and she loved him dearly, wanted every opportunity for him. Her time and resources focused on sort of the older brother. And, you know, as a result, Khalil was acting up quite a bit at school and really kind of got labeled attention seeker. Um, he was disruptive. He was really doing pretty poorly academically, kind of socially awkward. And our site coordinator kind of pushed back and said, he's not attention seeking. He's relationship seeking. So she started to put in a number of um, interventions in for him or basic needs and academic support. But the big thing is she matched him with a mentor. Miss Conrad, and they met for several years, um, once a week, talking, reading. They did a lot of reading together, playing games. They really built a pretty incredible relationship. So at the end of fifth grade, 
we had to say goodbye to Khalil because at the time, not now, but at the time, we were not yet at Manchester Middle where he was going to go to. So we sort of sent him off into the big wide world, hoping he would make good, good decisions and, and get across that graduation stage a few years later. So fast forward to the beginning of last year. We were working with our site coordinators doing some data mining, looking through what students are having academic or attendance issues, where do we kind of need to start, you know, at the very beginning with those supports with CIS. And when we were looking over the list, we saw Khalil's name. He was a senior, he was very behind on his credits, and he had basically stopped coming to school. So we encouraged Miss Lee, who was his site coordinator at Meadowbrook, to reach out to him, reach out to his mom, see if we could get him back in school and back on track. And she did. She took him a consent form um, for CIS and said, I'm here to support you. I will walk with you every step of the way until we get to that graduation stage. And he came to school the next day with his consent form in hand. Every day from that point on, Miss Lee checked in on him. Sometimes it was for big interventions or big things going on. Most days it was just a, good morning. I am so glad that you're here. And he started coming to school regularly, started doing better. Towards the end of the year, I got to go over to Meadowbrook, and I had the chance to meet Khalil. I explained, you know, that I was the executive director and who I was, and the first question he asked me was, do you know Ms. Conrad, his mentor from a decade before? And I did, in fact, because she is still no longer a mentor, but is still a supporter of communities and schools. And I said that I had heard about him through her. And he talked to me all about how much he remembered reading with her, how powerful that had been for him. So then I asked him how things were going with Miss Lee, his site coordinator. And his quick response was, I would not be here without her. I went out on quarantine, and being home was so much easier. No one really noticed that I wasn't here, but she did. And I come to school because of her. And I'm really thrilled to say that Khalil graduated in May. Yeah, really good story, I know. Um, I'm really proud of those outcome numbers that were on that slide. Um, but more than that, those statistics represent thousands of stories like Khalil's. So thank you for being part of it with us. Before, before you get away, Ashley, thank you for being here today and for the work that you are doing. Uh, we have a little gift uh -huh. for you. Is mine a pumpkin pie? That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So yeah, you, you might talk to some folks at that table and, and, and do a swap a or something. Yeah. <laughs> but we also have, uh, we have some baskets of um, donated materials. These are the personal hygiene items and the oh, black yeah. leggings and uh, uh, fidget toys yes. and journals and things. Oh, I think somewhere along the way I've lost count, but w these are probably about the 12th, 10th, 11th, and 12th basketfuls oh, that we've delivered to gosh. Salem Church. That's awesome. Tindy we also has been took a couple. Yeah, we also took a couple boxes up to. Um, can you guys get here? Oh, I um, took a couple boxes to Henning Elementary a few oh, weeks ago when they had awesome. a special appeal. Awesome. Oh, well, I was talking with, with Tanika on Friday that I was coming, and she was talking about how much you guys have done with this. It's, it is interesting to think about how much this makes a difference in a kid's day. If they come to school and something's going on with their clothes or, you know, they, they don't have deodorant to put on at home or things like that, I mean, just how much that impacts your whole ability to focus on your day and make friends and perform well. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's little things, but they are really, really huge things. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to offer a blessing for these. And friends, awesome. you, you know how we do this, right? Just extend your hands out. Uh, this is a blessing from us as a community of faith on these items. Holy God, we, we give you thanks for the opportunity to continue to serve our community and the people who live here. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this work with communities and schools to improve the quality of life and living in our neighborhood. And we ask your blessing upon these gifts that those who receive them will feel the love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ashley. Ms. Ruth, how are you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have some other gifts that we want to uh, acknowledge uh, this morning to recognize and give thanks for. And I want to ask uh, Turner Wilkes and Rachel Allen and Shannon McGuffin and Jennifer 